Welcome back to analog electronic circuits, today's uh, lecture number 22 and uh, today we are going to talk about two stage differential amplifiers and then we are going to move towards uh, the structure of op amps and we are going to start talking about op amps and how to work with op amps. So, this is the plan of the lecture, let us see how far we can go. Uh, before we start, I think I am going to continue from where we left off in the last class. In the last class, we were uh, talking about the folded cascode amp differential amplifier and we had worked out uh, this mess, which if you uh, look carefully is not very messy at all. It is actually very nice, right? You have got so many transistors and uh, we started from one transistor, we have come a fairly long way and I am very excited about this because uh, we started from one, now we are at you know something like 20 transistors, right? We are, we are able to comprehend and one of the important things in our being able to comprehend out of this, there are two things. One is symmetry, right? This side is the same as the other side, symmetry that makes things easier. And the other are these current mirrors, okay? The current mirrors are really playing a very important role over here. They are setting the currents in all the different branches of the circuit. So, you cannot underestimate the power of these current mirrors, okay? So, we spent a little time on current mirrors uh, uh, some time back, you know, and ever since it has been a ride, right? After looking at current mirrors, I am biasing only with the help of current mirrors, you know. I am mirroring, this is a mirror of a mirror, right? You start with a mirror, then you mirror it over here and then you set the currents here as well as here, right? You start with a mirror and then you set the currents over here, right? So, everything is based out of these current mirrors and um, it is it's actually very nice and you start with one transistor, a one transistor circuit and suddenly now you have built up this mesh of transistors, right? And uh, if I had thrown this circuit at you, you know, even 15 lectures back or 10 lectures back, you would have uh, immediately run away from this course, right? Because this, this looks like a big mess, okay? I throw this at you. 15, 10 lectures back earlier and you would be, you know, totally taken out. I mean, you would, you would have run away from this course. This course, you would have given up immediately. But now, after all these current mirrors, right, this looks pretty straightforward, right? I naught by 20, it is going to mirror over here, right? That is going to mirror I naught by 2 on this side. I naught by 2 on this side, it is going to mirror I naught and I naught through these two devices, I naught through I naught through this, I naught by I naught by 2, I naught by 2, they are going to nicely add up, you know, there is some structure inside this. So, I am uh, very excited about this, okay? I do not know how excited you are, but I feel uh, uh, very excited that we have come quite a long way from one device to 20 devices, I do not know what the count of devices here is, but uh, and it is comprehensible, it is not, uh, you know, totally out of context. I, I have not just placed these 20 transistors randomly, each transistor over here is playing a role, okay? It is setting some, either setting some operating point voltage or it is doing some mirroring action or it is a tail current source or it is some active load, okay? Lot of, lot of different responsibilities for each of these devices, okay? Now, there was one little thing that we, uh, uh, you know, skipped out of in the last class because of uh, shortage of time, right? And that was we wanted, we needed uh, the voltage over here to be 1 volt. If I had used a regular Wilson approach, then I would get 0.7 and 1.4 over here and 1.4 was a little too much because with 1.4 I was unable to do justice 
with this device you know I was getting exactly the same as uh, the telescopic cascode amplifier right exactly the same swings as with the telescopic cascode and that was really not very nice. I want to set this to 1 volt or lower, lower is better right. Can I set it you know maybe even not to 1 volt, can I set it to 0 0.9, 0 0.9 is acceptable ok, 0 0.9 would be optimal right. So, can I, can I do that? And I, uh, I think what you have to recollect over here, so I am just reminding you once again. So, I am just drawing this branch, all right, just this portion. If I do the regular Wilson, this is the regular Wilson, I was getting 0 0.5 plus 0 0.2, so 0 0.7 over here and 0 0.7 plus 0 0.5 plus 0.2, so 1.4 over here and that was too much, ok. We need to change the structure, any voltage over here within some bounds is all right. What are those bounds? What are those bounds? Can I have, uh, so here it is 1 point, I mean in this structure 1.4 is absolute, but let us say I am copying this. Okay. If this is 0 0.7, you do not have a choice in the matter, this has to be 0 0.7 for it to conduct the same amount of current, but the voltage here is flexible, okay. It has a lower limit of 0 0.2, which means the voltage at this gate can be anything above 0 0.9. So, it does not have to be this 1.4 volts, ok. Can I pick you know like 1 volt over here, is it possible? And the answer is yes, it is possible to do that, right. You do not have to employ this structure, you can employ any anything else for example. this is an alternate. Instead of a Wilson current mirror, you can do something like this. you could have done something like this. What will happen? This is at 0.7, you are forcing a current through it, so this is 0.7, okay. And then this is something more than 0.7, let us keep it at 1 volt. So, let us make sure that this resistor is such that the voltage here is at 1 volt, and then this will automatically drop to 0.3, okay. Is that okay? So, this will be at 1 volt, automatically this is at 0 0.3 which is nice, this is at 0 0.7 and now you copy it. So, all you have to do is choose a value of resistor over here such that the drop across that resistor for the given amount of current, I naught by 20, let us say is the current, 
Okay. So, you choose the value of this resistor such that the drop across the resistor is 0 0.3, okay, in which case the voltage here will be 1, right? this becomes 0 0.3. Okay, so, it is just a matter of choosing a resistor and now this is also an accurate current mirror because this is 0 0.3, this is 1 volt, right, 0 0.7. So, this tries I naught the same amount of current I naught by 20, it tries to pull I naught by 20, but when it does pull I naught by 20, this develops a voltage drop of 0 0.7 VGS. So, this becomes 0 0.3 which means this is 0 0.3, 0 0.70, 0 0.3, 0 0.70. So, this is exactly equal to I naught by 20 as long as the mirror ratio is 1 is to 1. Okay, so, this is also a true replica of the current. This is also, this is very nice in fact, this is a very nice current mirror. Then this is one strategy. Another strategy would be uh, what we uh, did uh, some time back. In, in class. So, this was another strategy that we had studied. We said by the way, these 0 0.5, 0 0.2, these are just numbers okay, that I have picked up from my head. In reality, it would not be 0 0.5 and 0 0.2. In reality, you will need VGS minus VT maybe of 250 millivolts, 150 millivolts, something. Okay. VT could be 0 0.5, VT could be 0 0.4, it could be 0 0.3, it could be 1 volt, whatever it is. Right. So, accordingly, you figure out what these numbers are. So, do not blame me for the numbers. All right. I am just letting you know in advance. The numbers I have picked are reasonable, they are realistic, however, they are not the absolute ones. So, a second strategy that we had discussed in class was to allow this to be exactly the same as before, like the Wilson, but then we will create a voltage drop over here with the help of one more device. Okay. What are you going to do? So, for example, if this is I naught by twenty, all right, point one size of 0.1, right. So, this is at 0.7 volt, this is at 1.4 volts okay. and this is also of size 0.1 let us say. So, it tries to reflect I naught by 20. and I want this voltage to be at 1 volt. I start from a voltage of 1.4, I want to generate 1 volt over here, suppose. Okay, how will I do it? All right, let us try to generate 0 0.9, okay, not 1. 1 does not work out with this. Okay. Uh, I try to generate 0 0.9 by dropping V t across this device. So, I am going to make this device really, really large. So, if this is of size 0 0.1, if this is of size 0 0.1, this is also trying to take I naught by 20 current. Okay. I make this device instead of a size of 0 0.1, I make it a size of 10. So, 100 times larger. So, W by L is 100 times larger that automatically means V g s minus V t is going to be 10 times smaller. 
So, I started from 200 millivolts, 10 times smaller is 20 millivolts, it is no longer in strong inversion, okay, which means it is you know in moderate inversion, it is a tiny amount of VGS minus VT that is required, almost nothing. Effectively, the drop across VGS is going to be just VT. Okay, so, I started with a VT of 0 0.5, this means this is at 0 0.9, a VT lower. All right, so, this is also one strategy and this actually gets you to 0 0.9, just right there. All right, this one was very nice, but you had to depend on a resistor. Resistors are, you know, they change their value with temperature, all kinds of funny things happen. You might not get exactly the right value that you want on an integrated circuit. Here there are no resistors, this is just plain transistors, you are just making one device much, much larger than all the others and taking advantage of the situation. Okay, so, there are multiple tricks to create this voltage. Now, you create this voltage and apply it everywhere, fine. Okay. So, this is uh, some, this was some leftover stuff from the last class and now what we are going to do is we are going to say that all right, now we know how to make differential amplifiers and uh, the ordinary differential amplifier will have a gain, a voltage gain of let us say the intrinsic gain of the MOSFET one stage. The cascode amplifier will probably have more gain than that because its output impedance is intrinsic gain times the ordinary output impedance. Okay. So, the effective gain of the cascode amplifier will be intrinsic gain squared. Fine. Okay. So, if I start with an intrinsic gain of 40, then maybe the cascode amplifier will have a gain of 1600, whereas the single stage differential amplifier will have a gain of 40. 1600 is not bad okay, for an op amp. So, a cascode differential amplifier could work as an op amp straight, straight away. So, this mega circuit might be able to work as an op amp, might. Okay, from the gain point of view, from the voltage gain point of view. Okay. If you do not like the cascode, some people do not like the cascode differential amplifier, then you can make a two stage differential amplifier. You do two stages, one stage followed by yet another stage, right, and that will give you enough gain to reach there. So, it is a similar strategy. Uh, I am not really going to draw it. However, I want to Oh, you want me to draw it, okay. So, each stage What do I place here? Current source or uh, MOSFET? Let us put a current source okay, with the intention of this being a MOSFET. Okay, so, this is my one stage. The voltage over here has to be set okay, by some current mirror, which is going to mirror. Now, you have figured that out, right? I hope you have figured that much out, that there is going to be a reference current and the reference current is going to be mirrored to make this current. Then that uh, another, there is going to be another mirror over here that is going to mirror it back and set this voltage. Okay, so, by now I hope you have uh, figured the strategy, figured out the strategy. Okay. Now, we are not going to stop at one stage, we, are, we need one more stage of gain. So, we are going to take these two outputs and apply them to a second stage. Now, a second stage 
could have an n MOS input, it could have a p MOS input. Let us you know assume that it has a p MOS input, in which case Oh, what is it? You are saying where is the tail current source? Okay. So, you could have had a tail current source over here, but you need not also. You have already got common mode rejection, right? Your signal to interferer ratio at the output of the first stage is much lower than the signal to interferer ratio of the input of the first stage already. Okay. You have already got that benefit. Right here in the second stage, I just forget about the interferer. Whatever I have, I just amplify it, both signal and interferer. Okay, possible. If you don't like it, you place a current source on top. Right? Some people are happy with this. Okay. So then again, you have to work out what is the voltage over here. You can work it out with the help of the same current mirror will work, for example. One more strategy is that I am applying input to PMOS. Who said I should apply input to PMOS? I should probably apply input to the NMOS and leave the PMOS as the load, right? One, one possibility is there. Another possibility is that you could apply PMOS to uh, input to the PMOS as well as the NMOS. Why not apply to both? And that will give you both of the GMs. So, you will get GM of this as well as GM of the second one, right? You will get the sum of the GM of these two. You are not clear? Yes, this looks like the CMOS inverter, right? The digital inverter. Okay, you do not like it. I think this is a digital circuit. The CMOS inverter is an analog circuit. Okay. This is your CMOS inverter. Okay, the idea is that if the voltage at the input is high, then the NMOS is on, the PMOS is off and that pulls down the voltage at the output. So, if the voltage at the input is high, then the voltage at the input is connected to output is connected to ground. If the voltage at the input is low, then the PMOS is on, the NMOS is off, which means the output is connected to VDD, supply voltage. Okay, but all of this is assuming that these two MOSFETs are working in the triode region that is not in the flat region of the characteristics. These two MOSFETs are either on or off. They are in the other region of their characteristics, right? You are assuming that your operating condition is over here. VDS is very small or it is very large, right? When it is very large, I is 0. VGS is low. So, in one case VGS is 0, VDS is high. So, you are on this x axis. In the other case, you have got VDS is 0. So, the MOSFET is on, which means you are on at this region, you are in the triode region. Okay? So, you are operating the MOSFET as a switch. All right. So, that is the action in the CMOS inverter. However, who asked you to operate it as a switch? Why are you applying input as 1, input as 0? Right? Let us apply input as a small signal around a DC operating point. So, let us assume that both of the devices are in saturation, 
are in their flat regions at the same time. So, the same current will flow through both. I can work out in that case the DC operating point required at the gate. So, for specific value of the gate voltage, this current is going to be equal to that current k into V g s minus V t the whole squared of the bottom one will be equal to k into V s g minus V t whole squared of the top one. Okay. And therefore, both of them will be in the flat region for that particular gate input. And at that gate input, let us apply a small signal riding on top of that value. So, for example, your inverter characteristics look like this. When the input voltage is low, the output is high. When the input voltage is high, the output is low. In between, you have some curve. Right? Let us apply exactly this voltage at the input. Okay. Let us apply exactly that voltage and then we will apply a small sinusoidal wave on top, a small signal riding on top of that input. So, when I have exactly that input, my output is in the middle right? and then I apply a small sine wave, I get a large sine wave at the output because of the high slope. Okay, so, I can use the inverter, the CMOS inverter as an analog amplifier. Okay. What is the small signal equivalent of this? So, you have got MOSFET, NMOS. So, you have, so your input is small v in. I am drawing the NMOS. This is GMV in RDS. GMN V in RDS N from the output to ground. And then let us draw the PMOS also. What is the PMOS doing? For the PMOS, this is the drain that is the source. So, it is going to be exactly the same. Okay. And V in is exactly the same. And this node is at ground in the small signal. All right. So, effectively you have got G m of the N MOS plus G m of the P MOS times V in. That is going to be your short circuit transconductance. So, if I put a short circuit over here, short circuit experiment, the transconductance will be G m of V in, G m n times V in plus G m p times V in. So, G m n plus G m p times V in is the transconductance short circuit. Output impedance V in is 0. So, this is gone, the other one is gone. So, the output impedance is nothing but RDS of P in parallel with RDS of N. And therefore, the voltage gain of this circuit is nothing but minus GMP plus GMN times RDS of P in parallel with RDS of N. Okay, that is going to be the voltage gain or in other words, you could write this as GDSP plus GDSN. Fine. Is this okay? So, if you had just one, if you were amplifying just with the N MOS and this gate was connected to ground, then you would have got GMN as the transconductance and the output impedance would be the same R d s p in parallel with R d s n. 
Now, you have got transconductance of GMP plus GMN. Okay, so, you have got a benefit in fact. So, you, you, can, you, you, you get even closer to the actual intrinsic gain of the MOSFET. Okay. So, this is not a bad design. This design is not bad, not bad at all. Right? I just pick an inverter as the second stage, a CMOS inverter. It can do a pretty good job sometimes. All right. So, this could be a two stage amplifier, first stage, second stage. Second stage does not have any common mode rejection. The carrier, the sorry, the, the signal to interferer ratio at the input of the second stage is the same as the signal to interferer ratio at the output of the second stage. However, the signal to interferer ratio at the input at the output of the first stage is much smaller than the signal to interferer ratio at the input of the first stage because of this tail current source right which creates common mode rejection how does this tail current source create common mode rejection the common mode half circuit becomes something else the differential mode half circuit becomes the common source amplifier whereas the common mode half circuit becomes a source degenerated common source amplifier and therefore the common mode gain is much lower than the differential mode gain and it gives me common mode rejection we have talked about all of this before i am just repeating myself so that you get it okay so i am repeating all right this is the two stage amplifier and this two stage amplifier is far simpler than uh, far far simpler than this for example right it still has it has a lot of transistors right you have got 8 plus 1 9 transistors over here right and then i have not drawn the bias network you you'll need some biasing right you'll need one uh, you need a reference current source plus a mirror right and then one more mirror right another two transistors to do the pmos and then at times you might want a cascode mirror and so on and so forth to get more accurate values okay so this is the two stage amplifier now i want to ask you something whether I make a single stage amplifier or a two stage amplifier or a cascode amplifier, right? it is either this or this, right? whatever it is, the output impedance of this amplifier, is it large or is it small? You see, our entire strategy from day 1 in this course, not maybe not from day 1, from day 2 or day 3 in this course has been to adopt the not an equivalent method. Okay. And what does that mean? That means that we are only talking about current sources. Okay. So, we are really playing with current sources. That means naturally our impedances are large, our source impedances are large. That is why we like Norton. For example, the flat region of the MOSFET, the output impedance is large. That is why we like the flat region of the MOSFET. So, automatically that means that when I am trying to make a high gain amplifier, my strategy is to keep transconductance the same. So, when I went from single stage to cascode. I kept the transconductance the same, G m remained more or less. right? The output impedance jacked up because of cascoding. Okay. So, the output impedance of the cascode amplifier is very large. The output impedance of this amplifier, which is not cascode, is also large. Okay, if it had not been large, I would have not got good gain. Right? My gain is 
the transconductance times the output impedance. So, naturally I want large output impedance. Okay. So, what does that mean? That means that the output impedance of my amplifier is going to be large. Okay. So, if I use either of these amplifiers, whether I use the cascode amplifier or the two stage amplifier, whatever I use, the output impedance of this circuit is going to be fairly large. Okay. That naturally means that if I am going to think of this as a building block in a larger scheme of things. So, this I want to imagine this as a building block, right? I want to encapsulate this in one you know, symbol like a triangle and think of this as a building block in a very large scheme of things, much larger scheme of things. Then that building block is like a voltage source or a current source? It is like a current source because it has large output impedance. Okay. So, I want to make an op amp. Okay. And what, what is the property of an op amp? Do you know if it has large output impedance or small output impedance? Small, right? Because the op amp you think it is going to work like a voltage source. Yes, you think the op amp is going to work like a voltage source, right? Voltage control, voltage source. It is going to amplify the difference between plus and minus by a very large number and give you a corresponding voltage at the output. So, this is ordinarily what we think of as the op amp, but does it matter if it is a voltage source or a current source? Well, to some it matters and what we do is instead of, so this is called the op amp. So, the op amp is technically a voltage source, okay, which means that it should have low output impedance not high, right? The ones that we have designed are not op amps. Why? Because the ones that we have designed have very high output impedance, all right. So, the ones that we have designed, we call them operational transconductance amplifiers. Okay, and the property of the operational transconductance amplifier, in short this is called OTA. The property of the OTA is that it has high output impedance. So, it is a voltage controlled current source. Okay. So, it amplifies the difference between plus and minus and then puts out a current. That is what we have made. That is actually what you have made, we have made over here, right? not this. All right, we have made an operational transconductance amplifier. For example, if we short this, then it is going to push G m times the difference between the two inputs. However, if we leave it open, then it is going to try to push the current, but it will end up making a voltage. Okay, if we do not allow it to push the current, it is going to try to push the current, right? but instead of pushing it through the output node, it is going to push it through its own output impedance and it will create a large voltage. So, it will end up producing a large voltage. right? So, it will have a high voltage gain if the output is left open. But if the output is not left open, if you connect a load to the output, then it is going to push that current through the load and create whatever voltage it creates. All right. So, this is what we have made. If we wanted to make an op amp, 
what needs to be done? You have to buffer this up, right? So, you take this OTA, which is what we have made. And then if you wanted to make an op amp, then we need to have a buffer stage, which has a low output impedance. What is a buffer stage? Something like a common drain amplifier. Where is this common drain amplifier coming from? It is a source follower, okay. it does not take any current, the gate is not taking any current, okay. so no current is going in. So, this voltage is going to be very high because it is the OTA is trying to push a current, it cannot push a current, it pushes the current through its internal output impedance. So, you get G m of the OTA times the output impedance of the OTA, which is the large voltage gain of the OTA, right. And then there is a buffer. This common drain stage has a voltage gain of approximately 1, so actually less than 1 in this case, right. And therefore, you get a large voltage gain and the output impedance of the common gate stage is low or high? It is low, okay. So, a common, uh, so an OTA that we have made, if I follow it up with a common drain stage, then I manage to make an op amp. So, this thing is an op amp. If I do not, then it is not an op amp, it remains an OTA. All right. So, let, let us keep this understanding in the background. So, there is a subtle difference between a real op amp and what we have made. So far, what we have made is this. If you actually want to make an op amp, then you have to follow it up with a common drain stage, a buffer, right, to give the low output impedance that an op amp deserves. Otherwise, the OTA has very high voltage gain, but that is not enough, okay. All right. Now, let us let us just think it through a little bit. So, your, you have a favorite op amp circuit, you have done some op amps in the past, I presume, you have done this circuit. You have done this circuit? Okay. Some of you seem to have done this circuit, many of you have not done this circuit. All right. So, we will do this circuit as a recap. So, this triangle is the op amp, okay. this triangle with the plus and minus signs. Okay. This op amp contains a very high gain amplifier voltage controlled voltage source inside such that the output voltage is that very high gain times the difference, this difference plus minus minus at the inputs of the op amp. Okay. So, the op amp has two properties. Number one, the output is equal to some high gain times the plus voltage minus the minus voltage at the inputs, the difference of the two inputs times a large gain is the output and this gain is of the order of 1000, 10,000, some large number. Okay, It has to be large for it to be an op amp, this is number one and number two is that the inputs do not take any current.
okay they absolutely don't take any current which is something that we have already ensured by making sure that the input is at the gates of the mosfets right the gates don't take any current so always you will see that the inputs are at the gates of the mosfets and therefore they don't take any current at all okay so we have already make sure made sure that these currents are zero okay this, this is already taken care of we have also taken care of the fact that when we have designed our op amp the output voltage here there is only one output voltage that output voltage is some large number times the difference of the two inputs okay and how large we i mean depends on the intrinsic gain of the mosfet mosfet has an intrinsic gain of let's say 100 then a two stage op amp will give you 10000 for example okay and that's fairly large for an op amp okay now the only thing that we have not taken care of is the vcvs action okay so this is what what we have made so far is an operational transconductance amplifier which looks like this pentagon right so this is what we have made so far and that if i follow it up with a buffer circuit that is a common drain circuit i end up making an op amp okay and that op amp will have will behave like a voltage controlled voltage source okay so far so good how does this circuit work now you can make think of this circuit as working in the following fashion the output is limited in range the output of the op amp can't be unlimited right this a times difference of the two inputs this is valid only within the swing limits of the output for example okay so let's say the swing limits of the output you have made a very good op amp the swing limits of the output are ground and power supply it can't be more than that okay so within ground and power supply you have you know this situation so your output is naturally within those two rails and therefore the input differential voltage has to be a times smaller than the output which automatically means that the input differential voltage is very very small for example if the output voltage is 1 volt gain of the op amp is 10000 then the input differential voltage is 10000 times smaller than 1 volt which is 100 microvolts all right so that means that this input over here is minus 100 microvolts let's assume minus 100 microvolts engineering approximation let's assume it is zero so the engineering approximation that you can do is you can say that these two inputs are equal they are almost equal right 100 microvolts apart is almost equal okay so engineering approximation these two voltages are equal if i have an input let's say v in then this current is going to be v in by r1 this current can't go into the mos into the gate of the op amp so it has to go the other way in which case the drop across r2 is v in by r1 times r2 and therefore if this is 0 volts the output voltage is going to be minus v in by r1 times r2 okay or in other words v out by v in will be minus r2 by r1 all right and to uh, many of you who have uh, seen the op amp before this happens to be your favorite op amp circuit is it or is it not it's not you have got one more okay this is one more favorite op amp this is the second favorite op amp circuit is it okay 
Okay, this happens to be your second favorite op amp circuit. There is one more op amp circuit that happens to be your favorite in that case. This one. Okay, so this is your favorite op amp circuit. For those who have not seen this circuit, once again, let us do the same argument. I have got a reasonable amount of V out, which means that if the op amp gain is very high, then the input differential voltage is nothing, which means that if this is V in, the voltage here is also engineering approximation is also V in. That means that this current is V in by R1. If this current is V in by R1 and the current in the minus terminal is 0, then that means all of that current is coming through R2, V in by R1 current is coming through R2. Okay. So, V in by R1 is coming all the way from V out through a resistive network of R2 and R1. Okay. So, V out is nothing but V in by R1 times R2 plus R1, which means that V out by V in is equal to R1 by R1 is 1 plus R2 by R1. So, for example, if you pick R2 equal to 10, 9 kilo ohms, R1 equal to 1 kilo ohms, then you will get a gain of 1 plus 9k by 1k, so 10. V out by V in will come out to be 10. So, these are all very nice circuits, right? These are very popular circuits. This is, you know, your favorite op amp circuit. There is a reason why these are so popular. The reason is that the voltage gain comes out to be a ratio of resistors or related to a ratio of resistors, and these resistors can be picked to be. Uh, uh, matched to each other, so that the ratio remains constant and as a result the gain of the whole circuit is well determined. Okay? There is no flexibility, there is no variability in the gain of the entire circuit. So, these are all very, very popular uh, circuits. So, this has a gain of 1 plus R2 by R1. All you have to do is pick the right values of resistors and you will get the gain. And then this circuit has a gain of minus R2 by R1. So, if you pick R2 equal to 10 k and R1 equal to 1 k, then you will get a gain of minus 10 and so on and so forth. All right. Now, my argument so far, I made uh, one argument that if the output is reasonable, then the input is 0. If the output is reasonable, then the input differential is 0, which means this is V in. Right. This argument is a little specious, it is it's filled with fallacies and we will see later on how to uh, go around these fallacies, how to give the right argument. As of now, let it remain, let this argument, let, this is a poor argument okay, that I have made. I acknowledge that this argument is poor, however, let us keep it at that, we will uh, sort out that argument later on. All right. Now, what is going to happen if in these, if in my favorite op amp circuits, the op amp is not an op amp, but an OTA? Is something bad going to happen? So, suppose I forget to put the buffer. Okay. There is an OTA and usually for an op amp, I need a buffer. Suppose I do not have a buffer over there. What is going to happen? Is it very bad? Can we check? Let us check. Okay. Let us check. So,
So, this is an OTA and let us say the transconductance of the OTA is capital G m. Okay, if it is an cascode amplifier, this capital G m is approximately equal to small g m. If it is a, a single stage differential amplifier, then this capital G m is equal to small g m and so on and so forth. Okay. So, this is my circuit, all right. And let us say in addition to capital G m, this transconductance amplifier has an output impedance of R out, okay. And the product of G m and R out is very large. G m times R out is a very large number of the order of let us say 10,000. Okay, that is the only thing that I have in hand. R out is large, G m is something, right? accordingly G m times R out happens to be let us say 10,000 and I have R 1 and R 2. All right, what is going to happen? How is this circuit going to respond? First of all, some current is going to come this way. Can this current go in? So, if I have V in over here, if this voltage is 0 volts, suppose this voltage is 0 volts, then immediately all V in by R 1 current comes, and all of it goes this way and reaches the output and automatically I have the output voltage as minus R 2 by R 1 times V in. Okay, so, the only thing is what is the voltage over here? If this voltage happens to be 0, if these two voltages happen to be equal, then immediately the output voltage is going to be minus R 2 by R 1 times V in and the circuit is going to behave exactly the same way as before. No difference with the ordinary op amp. Okay. What is this voltage? Let us say this voltage is not 0, let us say it is some V x. Okay. In that case, what is this current? The difference is V x, so the current is V x times G m, it is trying to push that current out. All right. And where is that current going to go? That current has to flow this way. Fine. So, whatever my output voltage is V out minus V x is V x times G m times R 2. All right, and this via uh, this current V x times G m, this current flows like this, but this has to be exactly the opposite of V in minus V x by R one. All right. So, you have got two relationships, your unknown is V out and V x, these are unknowns, two unknowns, two equations, we should be able to solve for them and work out what is V x, what is V out. Okay. So, we are going to do all of this in the next class. However, let me summarize uh, what we did today. So, first we uh, figured out uh, uh, leftovers from the last class, some important information about how to bias the cascode amplifier. Then we briefly did the two stage amplifier and then we transitioned from the two stage amplifier 
to see what is an op amp. Oh, by the way, we briefly discussed the CMOS inverter as well. Okay, and you can also use the CMOS inverter as an amplifier. That is also something that we discussed today. Then we transitioned from the two stage amplifier to an operational transconductance amplifier. Okay. And then now we are trying to see what is the difference between an OTA and an actual op amp. All right. And then we are now trying to play around with some uh, with a few op amp circuits. Right. We have not really uh, uh, done justice to them, but uh, we will continue with them in the next class. Thank you.